thank you for joining us today. I'm very pleased to see a number of you here. I'm Hannah, and I'm one of the senior associates um, in Mao and Kwai and Associates. Okay. Uh, before we begin the talk, uh, allow me to briefly introduce um, our firm and uh, what we do. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so we are a firm, uh, a medium-sized firm, uh, consisting 22 lawyers, as well as uh, 24 staff. Um, we, our clientele is usually, are usually um, small, medium enterprises, family businesses, as well as individuals. Um, we were established in 1985 by Dr. Marwin Kwai, a former Court of Appeal judge, uh, who is now a consultant with the firm. We're a full-service law firm with four departments, the Corporate Department, Dispute Resolution, um, Employment, and Individual and Families. We have five practice groups, the ASEAN China Desk, Construction, Foreign Direct Investment, Real Estate, sports and esports. Now we usually host uh, a public lunch talk uh, on a monthly basis uh, on a wide range of topics. Uh, however, given the uh, current situation, we have decided to switch online. And um, the purpose we do this is to share knowledge, to raise awareness as well as to encourage networking we do this for our clients, for our potential clients, as well as in-house counsel. And today, uh, this talk is the first talk uh, in this series. There will be more to come, and I will share with you that. Uh, with, I will share with you that uh, later on. Um, now, for some, uh, before I introduce the speaker of today, I would like to uh, just have some. Here are some housekeeping matters uh, for questions. Uh, as you are possibly aware already, we have Slido. So what you do is go on the website and key in the code U128. Now what you can also do if you cannot manage between two windows is to go on Zoom and PM me, private message me. So you, uh, instead of sending the message to everyone, you send to me privately, okay? Uh, we may not be able to address all, we try, but uh, still keep them coming and we'll try to address them tomorrow because we have a part two tomorrow. Now, if you're on Slido, uh, there is the possibility that your questions are already being asked. So what you can do is upvote uh, the question that you have and we'll pick the popular ones um, and address them. All right. Okay, now I would like to introduce to us our speaker. Introduce to you our speaker. Um, Christine is a partner in the Dispute Resolution Department. Uh, she holds a double degree in uh, Bachelor of Commerce, Bachelor of Business Systems from um, Monash University and the Bachelor of Law from UOL. She is a certified accountant uh, she's in the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants. She's a certified adjudicator and she's empaneled with the Asian International Arbitration Center. She was called to the bar in 2014 and her area of expertise are construction, adjudication, arbitration, litigation, taxation, family law, and contractual disputes. All right, um, I suppose without further ado, I will pass on the talk to Christine. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, on behalf of the firm, thank you for joining us um, this morning. I hope that this will be a fruitful morning for everyone here. Let's start. Um, I will start with the top points. So uh, we, will start, we will start with this um, COVID-19 MCO, some background info about this and how this come about. And uh, of course, we will go on with a very popular clause that I have a lot of inquiry from my client about this uh, force major clause. What is it? 
and can contractor benefit from it? And the next point will be extension of time. I think the issue of extension of time together with uh, claim for loss and expenses are two burning questions that a lot of uh, contractors, subcontractor employers have in their mind arising from this uh, MCO. And uh, of course we have this because as everyone is aware, this is unprecedented and hence does it, this event of uh, uh, COVID-19 MCO amounts to a frustration of contract. Does it apply? And lastly, we will end the talk with um, practical steps for contractor and subcontractor to take during and after MCO. Next slide, please. So this um, COVID-19 MCO, it was issued pursuant to Section 11, Sub 2 of the Prevention and Control of Infectious Disease Act 1988. And as we are all aware, it's effective from the 18th of March 2020 to 31st of March 2020 initially. But then it has since been extended to now is the fourth, uh, wait, 14th of um, April 2020. So basically, what is the effect of this? It basically restricts movement except for essential services. So in respect of con construction industry, two clarification has been issued so far by the Ministry of Works. The first one was issued on the 18th of March and it was subsequently updated to the 20, uh, on the 24th. And there's another one which was issued yesterday. We will look at it uh, shortly. Next, please. So this is the FAQ that was uh, issued by the Ministry of Works. So basically, it says, all construction and maintenance work are to be stopped during the MCO period, except for critical works. And then what is critical works? So they define critical work as any work that if it's not continued, it will result in danger or cause harm to workers, the public or the environment. And then the next thing is that they have listed down the example of critical works. So slope repair, pole patching, traffic management control. Next, please. And uh, we have scheduled inspection of lift, travelators, elevators, or other critical mechanical and electrical equipments, repair of lift, travelator, es escalator, or other damaged critical, critical mechanical and electrical equipment, maintenance work at critical services premises, facility upgrades at critical services premises, traffic light repair, Next, please. And uh, construction of the Bailey Bridge at the location where bridges have collapsed, tunneling works, emergency work incorporated into contract, maintenance, cleaning, and dry, drying of stagnant water, spray insects on construction site to avoid breeding of AIDS, mosquito, and other pets. Other works which, if not completed, will cause harm. Next, please. So based on the um, clarification issue yesterday, starting from the 29th of March 2020, you can now only apply for exemption under M and L, which we have just looked at, or other um, critical work that they have mentioned earlier, can, you can no longer apply for exemption. Um, Stella, can we have the previous slide, please? Okay, uh, <laughs> sorry, some hiccup here. So we will show you the, the M and, basically M and L means other works which is not completed will cause harm or 
maintenance, cleaning and drying of stagnant water spray. And so you can now only apply for exemption under these two categories. So how do you apply? The first step is you, first, you must first get the recommendation. It depends on whether you are a government project or individual project. If you are a government project, then you need to get the um, recommendation from the project XO or the project director. If you are a private project, then you need to get it from the resident engineer and principal submitting, pro submitting person. This was what they listed in the FAQ on the, on the 29th of, um, on the 18th of March. Next, please. Once you get the recommendation, then you can proceed to apply. So what they say in the FAQ is that then you can apply to those empowered to grant such exemption based on their respective jurisdiction. So you can go to the direct DG, the Director General of Works, DG of Malaysian Highway Authority, DG of Department of Irrigation or and Drainage, local authorities, state authorities, or the Gov Department of Occupationers, the DOSHLA, uh, basically. Next, please. So we are done with the um, FAQ issued by the Ministry of Works. Now I'm going to look at the advisory note. So PAM issued one, advi uh, one advisory note on the 18th of March, 2020, where they actually asked the architect to notify contractor on the need to comply strictly to the MCO. So in the advisory note, reference was also made to clause 4.1 of PAM, where they say that, where it says that the contractor shall comply with and submit all notices required by any laws, regulation, bylaws, terms, and condition of any appropriate authority and service provider in respect of the execution of the works and all temporary works. And PAM also um, informed the architect that its member, that contractor, to take all necessary measures to maintain and secure the site premises and in the and the in progress works on site. And PAM also urged the architect to ensure that the construction site, be it temporary work site, and uh, and the authorized workers house on site complies with the MCO and all applicable building authority regulation. And reference was also made in the advisory note itself. Reference was also made to clause 23.8 of PAM. And you have to read that together with Article 7 AD of PAM 2006, which deals with force merger. We will look at it shortly. So let's address these two burning questions. One, EOT, would I get my EOT? The second question, loss and expenses, can I claim loss and expenses? Next, please. Well, the short answer is whether you can claim for EOT, it depends on the terms of the contract. Now I'm going to introduce this term, very, very common term that we have um, here so much recently, force majeure. What does it mean? Force majeure clause, clauses are clauses generally intended to include risk beyond the reasonable contract of a party. In essence, it frees both parties from liability or obligation when an event such as war, riots, or act of God such as earthquake takes place. So where does this bring us? Bear in mind that force major clause, they are creature of contract. Is, there is no legal definition to this. 
And a very important point is that in order to rely on force measure, there must be a force measure clause in your contract. If there is no force measure clause in your contract, you can't rely on this. So we are going to look at PAM. Um, I, in this talk, I will make reference to PAM, and I, I do understand that there are some of you who are concerned with other standard form contract, such as um, PWD and IEM. I will try to address all this in um, FA, uh, our Q&A session. Now let's look at PAM. Clause 23 deals with EOT. So clause 23 says that contractor may apply for EOT if he thinks that works will be delayed beyond the completion date due to any of the relevant events in clause 23.8. So there's 24 relevant events in clause 23.8. This is PAM 2006 and there's 25 relevant events in the 2018 form. And uh, in particular, the relevant provision here will be 23.8A, 23.8P, 23.8W. These three provisions, we will look at each of them shortly. And there are similar provisions uh, in both 2006 and 2018 forms. So 23.8A is the force merger clause. And it was defined as any circumstances beyond the control of the contractor caused by terrorist act, governmental or regulatory action, epidemics, or natural disaster. This was defined in Article 7 AD. So I think that the current COVID MCO falls under 23.8A. And so I think, yes, contractor for PAM under PAM contract may apply for EOT. So the next question is, how? I have to stress one more time that EOT uh, arising from this uh, COVID MCO is not an automatic entitlement. You have to apply for it. First, you need to give a notice, a written notice. I will talk about the importance of written notice in a short bit. So you need to give a written notice to the architect about the intention to claim for EOT within 28 days from the commencement of the MCO. Bear in mind that this is a condition precedent. What, does, what is a condition precedent? A condition precedent is something that it has to take place before you can invoke this right. So it is expressly spelled out in the PAM contract that it is a condition precedent for this notice requirement to the architect within 28 days from the commencement of the event. In this case, it will be the commencement of the MCO. Then after that, you have to submit a final claim for EOT within 28 days after the cause of delay, supported with all particulars for the architect to assess. So within 28 days of the MCO, you need to submit the intention to claim. After that, after the event, which is the MCO, within 28 days, you need to submit a final claim with the particulars. And it is also expressly spelled out in PAM that if the contractor fails to submit the particulars, it is deemed that the MCO will not delay the completion of works. So this part, the, second, the third bullet point here, if the contractor fails to submit such particulars, so that means, let's say, within 28 days after the MCO, you submitted application, uh, your notice, your intention to claim for EOT. After the um, expiry of the MCO, you didn't do anything at all. You just leave it there. 
Then PEM says that it is deemed that MCO will not delay the, you think that the MCO will not delay the completion of works. So, and hence there is no EOT application. So please bear in mind, it's a two steps uh, process. You need to apply before, uh, the, um, within 28 days, and then you have to apply within 28 days after the MCO. Um, and also, as I have said earlier, it is not an automatic entitlement for EOT. You need to apply for it. Next, please. So, the, on, the, um, on the importance of uh, the notice requirement. So, Justice Mary Lim said in the Ipo Tower case that, in, within the, in the very strong words, non-compliance of the notice requirement render the matter unavailable for consideration by the architect. So, failure to adhere to the notice requirement is fatal and you will not get your EOT if you fail to comply with the notice requirement. And of course, that's provided that it is a requirement under your contract. And more often than not, it will be. Next, please. So just now we mentioned that there's three relevant events. We have looked at the force merger clause. Now we will look at the other two clauses, which is clause 23.8P. This deals with compliance with any changes to any law, regulation, by law, or terms and condition of any appropriate authority and service provider. That's 23.8. Then 23.8W says that suspension of works, of the whole works, oh, sorry, suspension of the whole or part of the works by order of an appropriate authority, provided the same is not due to any negligence omission, default, and or breach of contract by the contractor and or the NSC. So I think that these three clauses are the relevant clauses that the contractor can look at when they want to invoke their right to claim for EOT under PEN. Next, please. So we have looked at PEN. What if the contract is silent. There's no mention of force major, major clause, or there's no mention as to what happened in the event of the occurrence of event beyond the reasonable contemplation of the contracting parties. First thing first, I would uh, uh, advise you to look at the LA, the letter of award, and see if there is any incorporation of the standard form contract. Usually, it will, sometimes you will see that the first few paragraphs after uh, in the LA, you will say that the PAM contract will apply. Something of that sort. I will advise that have a look close scrutiny of the LA and see if there's any incorporation of the standard form contract. Well, if the contract is silent, then the general position is that the contractor will bear the risk. Next, please. Now we are moving into the next, um, type, uh, next burning question, loss and expenses. Can I claim? Again, it depends on the terms of the contract because Construction contract is, it, it is about interpretation of the terms of the contract. It very much depends on what parties agreed upon. So how do we get, um, how do we know what parties agree upon? That will boils down to the interpretation of the terms of the contract. But one thing again, I need to stress that if you're entitled for EOT under, if, okay, let's say you, there is an EOT um, clause, which says that you can apply for EOT. 
please bear in mind that it doesn't mean that automatically you're entitled for loss and expenses. The issue of time, i.e. EOT, and the issue of cost, loss and expenses, are separate. And uh, they are more often than not, they are governed by separate contractual provisions. So for PEM, let's say PEM, Clause 23 deal with EOT and Clause 24 deal with loss and expenses. Next, please. So these are the examples of loss and expenses I can think of. There are still, there's many others. Depends on the industry, depends on the nature of your work. Of course, the first thing will be the demobilization and remobilization costs arising from this MCO. Of course, there's site staff salaries and their accommodation, utilities, rental of forklift, excavator, and other plant and equipment, rental for ship piles, scaffolding, and of course, the cost of extended insurance coverage. I got the, I, I checked Slido before I check into this uh, group, and I understand that there is some. Uh, question on the insurance policy as to will the car insurance, the all contractor, uh, contractor all risk insurance cover this event of uh, COVID-19 MCO. I will address that shortly. Now I will look at loss and expenses under PEM. Clause 24 allows the contractor to claim for loss and expenses. And similar um, to Clause 23. Clause 24 listed 14 matters which may lead to a claim for loss and expenses. I've looked at the 14 matters and I think the one that is relevant before us is Clause 24.3 and suspension of the whole or part of the works by order of an appropriate authority Provided always that the same is due to negligence or omission on the part of the employer, architect, or consultant. So there's a similar provision in both the 2006 and 2018 forms. Next, please. So again, I have to stress that The key word here very much is a, this suspension order has to be due to some fault on the part of the employer, architect, or consultant. Next. So as you may already guessed, COVID-19 is not due to negligence or omission on the part of the employer, architect, or consultant. It is pretty much a neutral event. Neutral event in the sense that it is not caused by any fault on the part of any parties. So I think that it would be unlikely under the, the contractor to claim for loss and expenses under clause 24.3 and next please. So assuming that, that's just PEM, that's just PEM. So assuming that there is a loss and expenses clause under your contract, which cater for events such as COVID-19 MCO, it very much depends on the terms of your contract. I have to reiterate that many times. Let's, and uh, if there is a notice requirement, similar to our um, Clause 23 EOT application. I have to stress again that please, please comply with it. Again, this case in the Court of, uh, court of View in the Perbadanan, Perbangunan Pulau Pinang, I would uh, give some background facts of this case. So there is various um, variation issued by the architect. 
and the contractor did not make any application for direct loss and expenses. But it's not that the contractor didn't do anything. What the contractor did was that he write in to reserve his right. This again is quite common. I've seen in my, what my client has um, did because information is, uh, they do not have sufficient information at that juncture to put in a detailed loss and expenses claim. And hence what they did, they were write in to reserve their right. So this is what the contractor in Pembangunan Pulau, Pin uh, Pembangunan Pulau Pinan did. He wrote in to the architect to say, these architect's instructions and site instructions have affected our site program and revised construction period. We will submit expenses, loss, and other claims incurred as a result of the said architect instruction and, said, and site instruction in due course. Next, please. So, what the, cross, uh, what the Court of Appeal held is that under this particular clause, the, um, the, the contractor will have to lodge the claim by way of application to the architect for the project. And this is a prerequisite to the pursuit of a claim under this clause. The respondent, i.e. the contractor, act of merely reserving its right to make such claim at, a, at such time at it unilaterally deemed fit mean, uh, does not meet this prerequisite. So, uh, put it in a layman term, what happened is that in, the, in clause 11.6 of that particular contract, the contractor is supposed to put in the claim for loss and expenses as soon as practicably can. And what the contractor did was in fact write in to the architect to say that, oh, uh, I reserve my right, I will do it later. So what the court of appeal actually say that, no, 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 by you saying that I will do it later, unilaterally, without the agreement of the other side, the, contract, the other contracting party, is not a good reason. And hence, it does not meet the prerequisite under clause 11.6. In that case, the contractor was not allowed to maintain the claim for loss and expenses. Although, in his contract, there is a provision for loss and expenses. So, Again, I have to reiterate, please look at your contract properly and see if there is a notice requirement. Next, we'll move down to the doctrine of frustration of contract. Frustration of contract is, uh, is governed under Section 57.2. So it's uh, something provided under the law. A con and the definition provided is a contract do not to do an act which after the contract is made, becomes impossible or by reason for some events which the promiser could not prevent, unlawful, become void when the act becomes impossible or unlawful. So basically, it means that the contract is impossible to perform now. But unfortunately, the words impossible was not defined. It's not defined in the Contracts Act. Next, please. So we turn to case law. Kopa Sri Ram Justice of uh, Court of Appeal, as he then was, in the case of Guan Ait Mo, KL Sundaram Berhad, listed three elements of, for the, in order to, for the, to invoke the doctrine of frustration. Number one, the event causing frustration must have been one for which no provision has been made in the contract. If provision has been made, then the parties must be taken to have allocated the risk between them. Meaning, let's say in your contract, you have provided for what happened if COVID-19 MCO 
um, strike the uh, um, was uh, happened between during the um, execution of the work. In that case, what you guys agreed, what the contractor part, what the contracting parties agreed in the contract will take precedent, and there won't be any frustration of contract. The second thing, the second element is that the event must not be self-induced. And lastly, and that is the critical one, the event which is said to discharge the promise must be such that it renders it radically different from that which was undertaken by the contract. The court must find it practically unjust to enforce the original promise. Next, please. So another case law on the, what amounts to frustration of contract. Court of Appeal in Big Industrial Gas, St. Hut. The contract has fundamentally changed, which the party did not contemplate at the time of the agreement. The terminology used in both these cases that I've shared with you are pretty strong. Fundamental change, radically change. So, and also the court of view in this um, big industry case go on to say that the doctrine of uh, frustration is to be confined to very narrow circumstances. The reason being, I think, that commercial bargains should not be lightly avoided or brushed aside merely upon a change of circumstances. The Court of Appeal adopted what um, Justice Ab Abdul Malik said in the Ui Yok In's case. Next, please. So, does MCO lead to frustration of contract? Again, it depends. It depends on the facts and circumstances surrounding the construction contract. If it is such that the performance of your construction contract is, uh, is radically different or has been fundamentally changed. If it does not, if it does not, then MCO will not give rise to frustration of contract. As for myself, I think that the performance of a construction contract is no doubt harder now in terms of time and cost, but it doesn't mean that it is impossible to perform. Next, please. Well, the last thing that I want to share with you, these are my thoughts, practical steps during and after MCO. First of all, you must ensure proper protection of your equipment and machinery at site. And then after the MCO, you, we must always ensure that all site personnel to maintain personal hygiene, your hand washing and wearing of masks. And uh, of course, you have to have, give proper notice to all site personnel to practice self-quarantine if he or she is feeling unwell. And then you have to ensure proper functioning of equipment and machinery to avoid any accident. And because of this COVID-19 MCO, you may want to consider sourcing for alternative um, source of, uh, for raw material. And lastly, also check your insurance policy coverage to see if this, is, um, this event is covered and how you want to go about extending the duration of your insurance policy. I'll, leave, um, I'll, pass, I'll pass the floor back to Hannah. Okay, thank you, Christine, um, for, for the talk. Um, we have received an overwhelming number of questions. Um, give us some time as we sort through the questions, uh, if that's okay with you guys. Just uh, stay with us. Um, just give us five minutes as we sort through the questions. Thank you. I think in the meantime, I can address some of the issue. I can look at it, okay. I can look, I can address some of the Q&A.
one of the questions asked, see, as I try, can we pull up Slido, please? Yeah, this is the one, the first question. Can contractor claim the loss and, exp the loss and damages through contract contractor or risk insurance? Okay. Well, my, this is probably my tagline now. <laughs> it depends. It depends on the terms of your contract. But uh, based on my experience on the reading of the contractor or risk insurance, I will address that. So car insurance, um, generally they will cover two risk, I mean, two, two sections. Lah. Section one usually is um, material damage. Number two is the third party liability. So the first coverage is the one that we are more concerned, which is loss and expenses for, uh, in terms of the material. I've looked at the general cars insurance and um, the key point here to claim under this section is that the loss and damages has to be unforeseen and sudden. And then they, um, there are some events that was listed that uh, in the in cars insurance, uh, for example, things like earthquake, volcanis volcanism, tsunami, storm, floods, and landslides. So these are all these are all events that will lead to a sudden and unforeseeable and sudden and unforeseen damage to your properties, to your material. So I don't I personally I don't think that COVID-19 MCO give rise to a sudden unforeseeable arguably but not a sudden loss and it, the, the type of damages that suffered is not a sudden loss and damages under common law or PAM form contract is the contractor allowed to claim loss and expenses or costs incurred due to COVID-19 and how I've covered PAM uh, under common, uh, I've uh, uh, covered PAM just now, whether you can claim for loss and expenses. As to common law, as I've said just now, construction contract is to deal, is basically you have to look at the terms of the contract between the parties, what you guys have um, agreed upon and how you all has uh, allocate the risk. So I don't think there is any common law right to claim for loss and expenses. Another interesting question that I got is, um, yes, like I have uh, um, I promised earlier, I will look at also other form of uh, standard form of contract. So this particular uh, question is about PWD. So the question says this, epidemics is not under the definition of force merger in clause 58 PWD. Can the definition of natural catastrophe in the same clause be used for COVID-19? Okay, some background. Yes, clause 18, uh, clause 58 of um, PWD deals with force uh, merger. And uh, Clause 58.2 listed six events that comes under the definition of force merger. As I've explained earlier, there's no legal definition as to what is a, a, a force merger. It depends on the terms of the contract. So for PWD, they have listed six events. And yes, I agree that the uh, epidemics is not listed as one of the event of force merger. So then the question is, can you use another definition under clause 58.2, which is natural 
because natural catastrophe is an event of forced merger under PWD. I will read up. I will read to you. I will read that uh, particular clause. Natural cat catastrophe, including but not limited to earthquakes. Again, similar to what we've seen in um, the norm usual cost insurance policy, floods, subterranean sub spontaneous combustion, or any operation of the forces of natural na nature against which an experienced contractor could not reasonably have been expected to take precaution. If you ask me, COVID-19 MCO, does it fall under this definition? I don't think so. I don't think it falls within the purview of natural catastrophe. But having said that, it is not the end. I invite you all to look at clause 43.1 of uh, the same uh, PWD. Clause 43.1 listed 10 event, 10 events which they, the contractor can rely upon and where the SO may grant the contractor an EOT. So having a look at all the 10 events, I think that you can use clause for the 3.1i. And clause for the 3.1i says, the contractor's inability for reason beyond his control and which he could not reasonably have foreseen at the date of closing of tender of this contract to secure such goods, material and or services as are essential to the proper carrying out of the works. So I think that um, the contractor can rely on clause for the 3.1 I and uh, apply for the EO, apply for EOT. There's one question. Let me see. Example of item. What are the example of item which can be claimed as loss and expenses? as a result of MCO. I've listed some of the um, examples in my slides. I hope that you guys find that helpful. Okay. Um, Stella, can you move down? Is there any test or specific requirement for what constitutes fundamentally change or radically change? Again, a very good question. And, uh, but I can't, I can't answer you. Okay, let's see. Mm, what I can think of offhand now is that there is, example, okay, just example, is that there is this particular, let's say a particular contract which you, uh, you engage a singer, singer to sing, okay, in this particular premises. And there's a fire and the whole, the premises burnt down. So there's no place to sing now. And that amounts to, I think that amounts to frustration of contract. Sela, can we move a little uh, down? I want to see the more questions. I will address one more question and uh, let's see. Suffering from resources that are non-productive, e.g. idling P&E that are with renters still running, what are the ways to recover from such loss and expenses and or damages? Again, this, is, this has been addressed in my um, slides earlier. Idling plant and equipment and your loss and expenses. First of all, read your contract. See if uh, there is a loss and expenses clause claim. And then uh, you have to first, of course, comply with the requirement under that particular clause. OK. 
Okay. All right. I think that's about it. And uh, I know we still have lots of questions. And uh, do, take, uh, do keep in mind that this is a two-day program. We will have another session tomorrow, same time. And this time, tomorrow, I will, uh, together with us, will be um, John Wong from uh, Acclaim Consultant, uh, Martin Charlton. And then uh, we will also answer 10, we, first of all, it will, it will start with an interview and we will address 10 common questions that uh, contractor and subcontractor have and uh, that we have received. Then after that, we will also, what we will do now is that uh, from now till tomorrow, we will compile these questions that uh, we have in Slido and we will try to address them as many as we can tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Okay. Thank you, Christy. Um, Stella, can we go back to the slides, please? Okay, uh, everybody, this is the upcoming topics we have. Um, as Christine has mentioned earlier, uh, we'll have a part two tomorrow where we will address a lot more questions. Um, this will be an interview session with John Wong, the director of Charlton Martin Consultants. Uh, do, do also sign in for that. That will be a very interesting um, look at how uh, you can, he will address uh, 10 common questions he thinks contractors will be uh, concerned about or in interested in. After that, uh, on Monday, we have uh, something for corporate companies, uh, rescue mechanisms for distressed companies, corporate voluntary arrangement. This will be um, presented by our corporate department. And finally, we have something uh, for businesses on continuity, um, uh, going to be presented by Lamin May uh, from MWKA Tech. Um, we will leave the screen here for a bit for you to screenshot if you want to. Um, that's where you can sign up. Uh, you can also go to the events tab on our website. For those asking uh, for slides, we will be sending the slides to those who registered with us. We will send via email. To those who asked for the recording, um, it will be available up on our website in due course. So you can uh, take a look at our website uh, when the time comes. Uh, so basically, the feedback form? Yes. Uh, what we'll do is as well uh, email you a feedback form where you know, we want to improve how we do this, where you can just give us an honest um, answer or uh, uh, feedback on, on what you think of today's talk. Um, I think that's about it. Um, is there anything else from anyone else? Um, I think we want to put that the feedback form in the chat as well. Okay, can we share the link? I will, I will do that. I will send the link um, for the feedback form on the chat right now. Give me a moment. Okay, anything else? Mm, that's about it for me. Thank you very much once again for joining us. Uh, we look forward to see, to see all of you tomorrow. Thank you. Take care everyone, stay safe. Okay, um, the feedback form is on, in the chat right now. Please click and, and go to it. Yes, please do let us know how we can improve. All right, um, I think that's about And uh, you can keep uh, asking questions on the Slido. We will address yes. that tomorrow. The code will be the same for tomorrow as well, all right? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, have a good day.